Um, so hi everyone, welcome to Free Play Florida. Thanks for coming along. Uh, I think this is the first arcade-related panel today. Um, what we thought would be a good idea this year would be to just share a few stories with you about uh, what we in the collector community called an arcade raid. Um, a definition of an arcade raid can vary depending on what kind of raid you're on, but essentially an arcade raid would be uh, classified as the acquisition of a classic arcade cabinet. So uh, we're, all, we're all here for Free Play Florida, we're all playing these great classic games, but we just thought it'd be good to um, share a few stories with you about how you actually find a classic arcade cabinet. Um, so there's clearly a variety of ways in which you could do it. I guess the simplest way would be to go on eBay or Facebook see an advertisement for a fully restored Tron, hand over your three or four thousand dollars, take it home, and then watch it break down very, very quickly. Um, but the guys who tend to restore cabinets uh, wouldn't buy an already restored arcade cabinet, and typically they would uh, find these arcade cabinets in a variety of places. So that's what we wanted to share with you today. Before we talk about arcade raids, it's, it's, it's probably just worth um, reminding ourselves of a bit of arcade history. So back in the 80s, uh, during the golden age of arcade cabinets, when uh, these things were pro prolific and became part of popular culture, the industry was actually a very wasteful one. Um, so if you think about something like Centipede, which sold 44,000 cabinets, each one of those cabinets would have been built individually each one would have had a monitor put in it, side art, PCB, wiring, etc. And then they would have been put on trucks and shipped all over the country. Um, this, is, this is a shot in the Atari factory uh, where you can see rows, and rows upon rows of Atari cabarets. Here's Gen May. Um, and so as you can see, each cabinet was dedicated each one of these cabinets that you see in this picture would have housed an arcade game. Um, and they would have been distributed around the country. Hello, Jen. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Uh, so each of those cabinets would have been built in a variety of factories from Atari to Century to uh, Midway, Bally, etc. And young people dressed in 80s clothes would have played these cabinets in arcade in arcades all over the country. But given the average shelf life of an arcade cabinet would have been about six months when people stopped playing, when the coin drop literally dropped off a cliff and no one was playing these arcade games anymore, what happened to the arcade machines? So modern cabinets today would be generic in design and when people stop playing a game, you can pull out the modular uh, cartridge put a new cartridge in and suddenly you have a new game sitting in the same cabinet. Back in the 80s it was slightly different. Each cabinet was built for that particular arcade game. So unless the uh, cabinet itself was converted to something else, which is why you see uh, there's a, an interesting looking Atari cocktail table out on the floor, which I think used to be a Gravatar. And it's now been converted to something completely different. The monitor's torn out, new control panel overlay, new controls, a new PCB, it suddenly becomes a new game. But for the most part, uh, these machines would have been stored away. So the operator, one by one, when games are not being played anymore in the arcade, would start storing these uh, arcade cabinets, typically in a warehouse or a barn or an outbuilding, somewhere like that semi-trailers, wherever they can find to put them at the time, they would just stash them in there. Right. Um, and over the years, they would collect dust. And given that the cost of storage, I guess, over here in the US is relatively cheap, or certainly was, very often these cabinets would sit in these dusty warehouses, never to be seen again. I'm obviously from the UK. Jen is from uh, here in the US. and. There's, there's some subtle differences between finding arcade cabinets in the UK and finding arcade cabinets in the US. The most obvious one is you guys had a pro proliferation of arcade cabinets. The size of your country, the fact that most of the manufacturers were here simply meant that 
in sheer number terms, there are far more cabinets here still left in the, in the US than there are in the UK. So much so that now pretty much the typical way of us in the UK acquiring a new classic arcade cabinet is to buy one from people like Jen, fill up a, a, a container and literally ship it over to the UK. And that, that now happens on a regular basis. I would say every, certainly every two months there's a new container arriving in the UK with 40 classic arcade cabinets where a group of us have all got together and bought a bunch of them and, and, and shipped them over. And to touch on that, a lot of, a lot of operators here, is that you? That's me, sorry. Uh, especially like CoinOp, they do a large shipment over, overseas and a lot of people hate on it, but we have such an abundance here, we're not gonna run out. So people's like, stop shipping them overseas, but they don't have it, so if they're willing to pay it and it's still for the love of the game, I don't see why people hate on it. It's just getting it to people that still love the game, enjoy it, and they want it over there. So I wouldn't hate on it, it's just spread the love, you know, so. Right. Um, demand in the UK is enormous. Uh, it's gone crazy over the last few years. Y'all um, drove up our prices over here. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so typically where once upon a time you could find an old centipede cabinet and pay 200 English pounds for it, that same uh, unrestored centipede cabinet that looks pretty trashy, you can now pay anything up to 1,000 pounds for it, and then you've got to restore it and fix it. So the prices have gone crazy. So if we can find a $200 centipede over here, pay another $200 to get it shipped over on a container, you can see it's a worthwhile business. So an awful lot of collectors now are looking at the US to acquire cabinets and to get them shipped over. Um, the key thing that Jen and I are agreed on when it comes to actual arcade raids is Intel. And by Intel, I obviously mean in intelligence. You need to put the groundwork in. You need to make phone calls. Uh, you need to look at an eBay auction for a Defender arcade cabinet and then out the corner of your eye in the right hand corner you spot th the left hand side of an Astarac marquee. <laughs> and so rather than bidding on the Defender that you're seeing, you're trying to contact the guy to say, oh, I just saw something there in the background, have you got anything else for sale? And that's how you get to the juicy stuff. Uh, if you watch these um, American Pickers program, they always say, the interesting things are actually stuck out in storage. It's not the thing that you see advertised for sale, right? Um, right? Yep. Yeah. So the obvious stuff might be for sale, but actually, what have you got out the back? Have you got any outbuildings where you know, all your old stuff is? And that, that's where you get the clues. Um, another thing, that would, another sort of tip I would have in the UK, if you buy an arcade cabinet and there's a operator's phone number on the back from the 80s or 90s, Try and find where the operator is. The chances are they've gone, but it could be the guy is still alive and he might have some cabinets in his house and he might be interested in selling them. Um, uh, sorry, Jen, go ahead. No. <clears throat> to touch on that real quick, I, there's a great story. He didn't, you don't even know about this. I found a bag on the back of one, called it. It had an address on there, so I Google mapped it and Google earthed it and you can zoom in and you can actually see the building with the two, cons two computer spaces sitting right in the window of the building. So I called it, this is back in Missouri in St. Jen. It said, hey, you know, I, s I heard you have arcade games, you shut down and stuff, is there anything you wanna sell? And he's like, yeah, I don't care about this. I go to the building and it was flooded, but computer spaces are fiberglass so they weren't ruined or anything. So we pulled two computer spaces out of there just off of zooming in off of Google Maps and seeing it in the picture off of a tag on the back, so. Another thing in the UK, an awful lot of arcades were on the coast. Um, so sitting with the yellow pages for a, a, a town 300 miles north and just ringing all of the arcades and just saying, do you have any old machines? And you'll make 10 phone calls and maybe out of one you might strike it lucky. And the guy says, actually, yeah, I've got a garage full of junk and I need to clear it out. Why don't you come and take a look? And of course, it turns out to be a gold mine or it might turn out to be a load of rubbish. But it's all about intelligence, putting in the donkey work, thinking you know, beyond what you see on eBay and just thinking beyond the box and making the calls and just getting, getting in, 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 in people's faces. There's another common thing about arcade rates and uh, I, th I think it's pretty universal over here and in the UK, and that is when you've identified a location or you have a lead on a potential stash of classic arcade cabs, you do not talk about it to anybody. 
you do not go on a forum and say, hey, I found a bunch of arcade cabinets in bar, or oops, I don't mean anything to you guys, a stash of arcade cabinets in London. People are ruthless and people are very clever. And with the advent of Google, and as Jen says, Google Maps, it goes, oh, whereabouts in London's that? Oh, it's um, you know in the southeast in a little town called Croydon. Well, people are smart. They go on Google Maps, they do the aerial view, they zoom in and go, I reckon it's there. That looks like a suspicious looking building that maybe used to be an arcade. And they'll get in there and they will not hesitate to screw you over. Isn't that right, Jen May? Yes. I've, a guy actually said, hey, is it, I posted up on Facebook, is this game worth anything? And he had location tagging on. Somebody found it and went there and showed up at like midnight saying, hey, you know, like just showed up out of the blue, just off a of location tagging off of a picture you post online. So it's, unless it's in your truck and you're on the way back and paid for it, you don't say anything about it until it's in your possession because people are, I mean, it's right. ruthless. Yeah. yeah. So a key tip on all of this is if you get a lead on a stash, keep it to yourself or share it with just friends that you're going to go with to pick these cabinets up. Um, so we thought we'd just run through a, a few arcade raids, some I've been involved with, um, some Jen has uh, executed herself, and others are just arcade raids that I've written about over the years that um, are just slightly different and interesting. Uh, interestingly, just last week, I uh, uh, was involved in an arcade raid in Ireland, um, and this one came about with uh, from a guy who lives in Ireland who went to a arcade, which unbelievably is still open in Ireland, and this is the arcade. It's called Bob's Family Entertainment Centre. It's been there since uh, the late 70s. Um, and unbelievably, they were still operating an awful lot of classic arcade cabinets, many of which have been there for over 30 years. He got talking to the, the owner. It turns out Bob is no longer with us. She was his daughter. She was kind of running the business down or looking to refresh the cabinets that were in there. And so he was in, he had a lead. After much digging, it turns out, yep, yeah, they've, they've got lots of classic arcade cabs. She wants to get rid of them. Um, he realized he didn't have the resources, either financially or time or knowledge, in order to execute it. So he came on, the, on a UK forum, put the information out there. Um, and one of my collector colleagues in the UK, um, who's experienced in pulling off enormous raids, just basically picked up the ball and ran with it. He flew over there, checked the place out, um, and what we identified was 16 interesting cabinets, one of which you can see was this uh, Tato Grand Champion cockpit cabinet. Extremely rare, she had two of them. And uh, we identified 16 that, that she wanted, but there was a bit of a problem. Um, you might think those are centipedes, they're actually generic jammer cabinets, uh, unique to the European market. So a jammer cabinet essentially is a bare cabinet. You put a PCB in, it will play a game. When you want to change the game, you pull that PCB out and put a new one in, and suddenly you've got a new game. Those cabinets there are equivalent to our Aladdin's Castle cabinets that all the Aladdin's Castles ran, where it was just generic cabinets that they would change games in. Yeah. Um, as great as it is to see, so these are dated from sort of late 80s. As great as it is to see these, um, the problem is no one wants them. Collectors don't want them. They're not really worth a great deal to us. We want the, the dedicated stuff. Uh, but our Irish friend was digging her heels in. You're not taking the 16 cabinets that she clearly got wind that we wanted, unless you're taking everything else as well. Um, so there were about 20 of these. So we were like, well, what are we going to do? Because I've got nowhere to put these things. No one else had anywhere to put these things. But we've, we've got to take them, otherwise the deal's off. So a lot of delicate negotiations. <laughs> Long story sideways, we got hold of a guy called Andy who runs Arcade Club in the UK. Um, he's got two locations. It's uh, Europe's largest classic arcade. If you ever come to the UK, you must check it out. It's absolutely fantastic. He has a need for these things. So what we said to him was, we'd like these, but you're welcome to take those. And that's exactly what happened. A couple of other interesting things that came out of the raid was this. Um, there were two of these. This is an Atari TX1. It's a triple screen pole position, kind of think of it like that. Absolutely enormous. Again, where the hell is this? Who can put that in their house? Who's going to lift it? Where's it going to go? Again, Andy stepped up to the plate. He's got the, the big arcade where he, he, he can place it, so he was able to take that. My own spoil from the raid was this uh, great-looking red tent, uh, which is running versus tennis. Uh, um, 
probably not very unusual to you guys, but over in Europe, we, we never saw these, and only a handful of them ever made it into Europe. This has been operated in that Irish arcade since 87. It's been on the floor, and it was being operated up until August this year, unbelievably, um, still taking money. Um, it's in great condition, got it for a great price, so I was very pleased. So bear in mind, it's Ireland, it's over the sea. Uh, we flew over there. We obviously couldn't put um, a red tent in our hand luggage and bring it back, um, so we arranged for two what we call Arctic lorries. Is that what they're called over here? Semi-trucks. Semi -trucks. We've got two semi-trucks, um, loaded them on with uh, a, a forklift truck. A forklift truck. Got them on there, shipped them back. There you go. And those are the cabinets that I mentioned earlier. They have now arrived. They are in the secret third location that's yet to be announced of Arcade Club. He's lined them all up. They all need going over. They all need re refurbishing. Um, so again, it's just, it's just hustle, arranging, lots of phone calls, lots of negotiation. She was as hard as nails. There were no deals to be done. Um, but we got there in the end, got the right people involved. Um, I managed to, uh, to uh, pull it off. Jen is going to take over here, and she's going to talk to you about an arcade raid relatively local to here in Tampa, which we like to call, Jen, Tampa Storm Damage. <clears throat> it wasn't really Tampa. It was about an hour and a half north up near Spring Hill area. Um, but the guy was an operator, and he was in Lakeland. And somebody gave me a lead that he had some games sitting in a building for... 20, 30 years, and they've been untouched. So they gave me his number, and I called him, and it took me probably every bit of two months to break him down to let me actually come out and see what he has. He's a very, like, untrustworthy guy. I didn't trust anybody. So I finally get out there, and he's very, like, taken back that I'm actually a female about to buy, you know, like, that I'm into these games and stuff like that. So he shows me what he has, and he's, like, he opens the door, and he's like, you have 30 minutes to look around. Be careful. If you die, I shut the door. You'll never be found. Okay. So everything's in dust. I mean, I'm talking, you can't see anything. So I've got the flashlights on, water, because it's 106 degrees down here in July. So I do the raid out of there. I buy, he lets me come back three times. He only lets me buy six games at a time. So I befriended him, and he tells me he has this other property in Brooksville. And so I started doing home remodeling for him, and I remodeled the whole house, um, top to bottom, like drywall, bathroom, tile, everything. And he was paying me in games. So he takes me to, <laughs> it was great, because then I could set my prices on how much I make. So he takes me to this place, and this is a building that had got hit by a storm, and it collapsed. And there is, there's a, this red tent is actually holding up the building. So we couldn't pull that out because the roof would totally cave in. I was able to pull Play Choice 10 parts with 10 carts, and they all worked. I actually dug out an um, alien syndrome board, and it worked. Um, this is a trailer that had more games on it. The front door was busted, but that had three or four red tents in it, five Nintendo cabinets, a um, couple more centipedes. So... Every week I would get to pull some games after I finished working on the house. And that went on for a while. I finished the house and I, I pretty much got all of his games. Um, but all of these, even though those pictures are that bad, I mean, everything's worth parts. And people always need parts to fix games that, you know, they, they can't come by because so, they're not making them. So it's, it's easy to just pull parts off of rotted out cabinets and stuff. So it's just... It takes a while like, to befriend somebody, to get them to trust you, to let them into your property and stuff. So it, that's the kind of the hard part of it. But the guy looked at it like, these games, I don't make money off of them anymore. They're just sitting there wasting away. So he wasn't anything out of pocket paying me to remodel his old house, pretty much. So, But to me, I think I ended up getting 40 games from him after it was all said and done. And I made like 50,000 so off of a six-month project. So it was easy. you know. So that's just bartering. That's how I did that one. Holy cow, nice. So, huh? I said, holy cow, yeah, nice. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, good. Uh, another one for me was, this was in France. Um, you've got to be stupid, frankly, to decide to drive 500 miles to pull off a raid, but that's what we did. So this was an unusual one. This was an English guy who bought a house in France, um, and it all started with a Facebook advertisement and he put advertisement. A, he, I'm sorry. What was that? Did I miss something? You said advert. Advert. Sorry. Advert. Advertisement. Aluminum. 
Um, aluminium. Aluminium. Uh, so he, it was an innocuous advertisement for a PCB board on Facebook. A friend of mine messaged him and said, have you got anything else for sale? And he said, well, yeah, funnily enough, I've just bought this house in the south of France. And I bought it sight unseen, other than pictures. I've, I've handed over the money. I've picked up the keys. I've entered the property. And um, it's full of arcade cabinets. Um, I'll just let this play in the background. So he said, it's full of arcade cabinets. And the guy was like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well... I, I don't know, it's like some sort of cafe or something, but the bottom line is we've, we've opened the door and walked in. There are arcade cabinets absolutely everywhere. Um, and so my friend got r quite excited. Long story sideways, he rounded up 10 of us. We rented a bunch of vans and we went on this crazy thousand mile round trip to get down there on the basis that we could buy whatever we want for an agreed price of 60 pounds a cabinet. Um, and if you're getting the impression also from this building that it's not in the greatest state of repair, um, the entire first floor of the building had collapsed. So you think, imagine this is a three building, uh, a three story building. This entire ceiling had just basically collapsed on top of whatever was on the ground floor. Um, a couple of the guys who were on the uh, raid were builders, and when we got there, not knowing what to expect, we were assured that the building was, um, had been made safe and we would be okay to clamber around and pull these cabinets out. They walked in there, took one look at what we were dealing with, and walked back out and said, we're going home, we're not going to go in this building. Seriously, if you guys go in this building, someone's going to die. Um, so we bought them a coffee, sat them down, talked them round for an hour, got them back in there. Um, 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 what you'll see is uh, um, there were poles which, which you use to prop up a building that's collapsing in on itself. And this guy, there you go, that's floor one, and that was once the floor, which had just all basically fallen in on itself down below. I mean, you see there's just, it's just chaos and madness everywhere but all, all sorts of things in there um, and these poles that they were were supposed to be secured to hold the ceiling up had been placed on milk crates so you basically had milk crates holding the ceiling up in in um, in certain parts uh, so it was quite the adventure um, that pinball needed a bit of work as you can see we like to say it just needs a fuse yeah so that's our joke here. right um, so there were, fr there were three, you see the door just swinging with nothing underneath it, where that, that floor's gone. Um, there were three stories and some outbuildings up at the very top of the building uh, in the, what we would call the loft. Would you call that a loft or an oh, attic? Loft. The loft. Yeah. Um, uh, up in the loft there were holes in the roof, so the rain had come in, it had gone all over the ceiling. Over the years the ceiling had just fallen in on itself. There was one cabinet that we didn't pull, and that was a ricochet. A very, very early Pong clone, I guess you would uh, uh, de describe it as. And you'd walk to the top of the stairs up into the loft area, and you could see over there on its own was a ricochet. And you're like, oh my God, there's a ricochet. <laughs> Started walking, took one step, and you just felt the entire scene just kind of go like that. And it was literally a V shape where it was, if you stood on the middle, this is coming up to the loft now. If you stood in the middle, it was very obvious the whole thing was going to was going to fall in on itself. So it was like, have you guys seen the Italian job, the film? You know, when the gold's at the end of the coach and it's hanging off the edge of the cliff? And they can't get the gold because the whole coach is tipping over and is going to fall over. It was exactly the same. It was this ricochet and we just couldn't get it. We had to leave it. No one was prepared to, you know, walk across this floor which was clearly going to collapse in on itself uh, that's a grand track and when you moved it the bottom stayed where it was it was just completely waterlogged uh, so again this is up in the roof a whole bunch of stuff uh, you'll see the ricochet in a minute there 
that's the ricochet. You just couldn't walk along there because the whole lot was going to come through. And there was a bunch of pins and uh, various bits. Suffice to say, it was quite an adventure. Uh, that was an, uh, an interesting battle zone we pulled out that had been converted into something or other. That just gives you an idea of the what we were dealing with, trying to get these things out. And if you can make out there, that's the battle zone coming down. And you can see what we're walking on there. And the whole thing was just moving, and the, it was just slanted like that. It was all just about to go. Suffice to say, we all made it out alive and uh, pulled out some very interesting um, cabinets all the way from France. And we upset the French, which was an added bonus. Absolutely <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed that. They all got very upset that we drove in, grabbed the cabinets, and bunkered off again. Uh, back to Jen, who has a bizarre story about a warehouse in Missouri. <clears throat> so this was another one. Um, There's a guy that had a, a retail store in the mall, and I actually was a, a retail management in the same mall. So on my break, I would go down and play arcade games at his place, but it was, he didn't like to play them because they were for sale only. So it took a, probably about four or five years Honestly, of me talking to him, going down there, explaining to him, I know games, I'm, you know, I don't bullshit. So he tells me he has a warehouse, and for six years I thought he was just BSing me, BSing me. He would never take me, never gave me any details about it. I leave St. Louis. I'm, I'm living in North Carolina, and he calls me, and he's like, hey, I gotta, I gotta move my games. We're moving. So I fly, I fly back. This, I, I don't know if I drive or fly at this because I went there twice. But regardless, I get there, and I think I flew at this one. We flew. We flew there, and um, and so there's an elevator. This is a 1954. This is Ideal Novelties, actual first building that Ideal Novelties. And you know they built arcade games. There's conveyor belts. There's still parts on the conveyor belts of games that Ideal Novelty actually built, like Rayomatics and stuff like that. Nobody's been in this building since '54, other than the storage. So. <clears throat> there's a there's a freight elevator. It's a big it's a big one. There's cars in the basement of this building that that are stored down there. So it's three floors. Um, so we throw some games on the elevator shaft. We climb up to the third story. So I have to climb up these ladders. So I don't know if you can flip to the ladder picture. You don't have a ladder? I sent you a ladder picture. I don't have the ladder picture. I'm sorry. You have one job. That was the <laughs> so, There was this ladder. It's this big. It's like this wide. I'm in so much trouble. Sorry. And, <laughs> I am not paying for your dinner. Um, so I have to climb up this, and then we have to climb across a platform, and we have to go out. Do you have the rooftop pictures? The belt you... I don't have the rooftop pictures, everybody. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll have to picture a rooftop. Do you know what a rooftop looks like? Just picture that. Anyways, there's a bell tower with this elevator thing in there. So you have to flip the switch. like It's like a Munster's like, flip the electricity kind of electric switch thing on. We flip it. The motor burns up. We have 22 games I just paid for in a basement and no elevator. So I'm talking Cheyennes. We, there's a missile command cockpit, so I paid 50 bucks for it. It's stuck in this building because there's no elevator. I call up some buddies because I'm from St. Louis. I said, hey, I just bought 22 games. We're moving them up three flights of stairs. We carry 22 games up three flights of stairs out of this basement compartment thing and it was just, it was a mess. So this, so yeah, so here's, here's, so you have some pictures. Here's a couple of them. The, we got the ice cold beer, shine, that's three space duels. Um, we got a tax scan, eliminator. Um, so my trailer, oh, so I must have drove this time. So the trailer was so full, I strapped one to the front of the, front of the trailer too. I do that a couple times. And I drove from Missouri to Florida like that, so, or North Carolina where I was, wherever I was at at that time. But, um, so there was, there was this office there. So this, this place closed down, 1954, and you know he takes me on the tour of the building, and he's like, just don't touch anything. Just, you know, everything's preserved, don't touch anything. So I walk into this office, and it's just amazing. Calendars on the wall, rotary foam. And on the, on the tables, there's this book, and it's a bonds book. So like, it was like a checkbook for ideal novelty, the owners and stuff. And I pick it up. So mind you, no electric. No service in this building. I pick it up, and no sooner do I touch it, the phone on the desk rings, right? 
I'm glad I had to change pants in my truck. So he was like, did you touch anything? And I'm like, hell no, I didn't touch anything. He's like, well, so we, we think, so anyways, I ended up taking the Bonds book. Shh. <laughs> so now my husband says we have a haunted spirit attached to this Bonds book in my, in my curio cabinet. But um, I told him I took it later. But and, and another cool thing I got out of there was off of the conveyor belt from 1954, Ray Omatic. It's a game called Shoot the Spook. It was very controversial at the time. You take a ray gun, and there's a skeleton face with a light bulb in there, and you take the ray gun and shoot it, and it's all black lighted. And um, it, was, it was wrapped up in the, in the protective paper, still on the conveyor belts. I did ask if I can have that, and he said, yeah, take it. So I do have, it's a hanging above my garage door with black lights on it, but everybody's like, what? And I'm like, it's a game, you know? It's like, but I mean, for that time, 1954, for that kind of, kind of stuff is kind of crazy. But you can kind of see the fuse panel thing in the back. It was like all the paper fuses and stuff. It was, it was a crazy building, but 22 games up three flights of stairs. So the things we do to get these games out for you guys to enjoy on the floors, you know? Jen also just broke rule number one of arcade raids, which is you don't talk about arcade raids. So you've just told us that there is a missile command cockpit in Missouri stuck in an elevator to this day. I paid for. I mean, I'm there. You can't get it out. The elevator. I I literally told my friend, get some tow chain. I was I had a sledgehammer in my hand, ready to bust this game apart to pick it up in pieces. Cause you know, I mean, it's there's like what 50 of those games known to exist. The if missile I, command. Cockpit. There's 50 of. Them. And he's like pulling me out of the stairs. He's like, we can't get. It. I'm like, we're getting it. And it's like we've been there 14 hours now doing this. And I'm like, I'm getting this game. And he's, I mean, that my friends pulled me out. I was like, yeah, I was mad. Like, but I have a paid for, you know, missile command stuck in a basement in Missouri. Cool. Oh, we can get it. We can get it. Yeah, let's, let's talk <laughs> afterwards. Uh, this is not my raid. This is not Jen's raid. But this is just a really interesting one that I was lucky enough to write about on my blog. Uh, computer space barn finds, um, you know, classic looking barn, guy goes on a walk with his dog, walks past this barn and goes, what the hell's that up there? And he realizes at the top, it's a computer space. First commercially produced arcade cabinet, et cetera, et cetera, worth an enormous amount of money. He spends an awful long time trying to find the guy, the guy who owns the building. Could he get access to the building? Would they be for sale, et cetera, et cetera. Spends an awful lot of time investing in uh, uh, you know, investing in this guy, getting his trust. The guy finally agreed to uh, sell him the computer space. They get there, they climb up into the barn, and they realize the whole thing's moving as they're, as they're up there. They're very worried about how on earth are we going to get these things out of this rickety old barn without the barn collapsing in on itself. Um, they dig a bit further. The stuff to the left is old electromechanical stuff, I think, but that was completely waterlogged. The nice thing about a computer space is it's fiberglass, I believe, so therefore it doesn't get waterlogged. It might get wet, but it won't get waterlogged. Um, and when they get up there, there's not one blue computer space. There's two blue computer space machines. Um, so they're working out how to get it out. Um, I, I just thought this was a cool video, which I just thought would be worth... Um, sharing with you. So sometimes you, you've got to take a few risks. Um, apparently the whole thing's moving as they're moving around. They're just worried about the whole thing falling apart. So what do they do? The guy, the guy who owns the property says, well, hang on a second. There's a farm next door. Why don't I go and ask him if we can use his tractor? And so he gets the tractor. The farmer comes along with the tractor, gets the, what's that called over here? We'd call that a scoop. What would you call that, Jen? A scoop. Gets the scoop, a front loader, one by one, they bring down the computer spaces by the power of a tractor. I just thought, I just thought that was really cool. Um, both of those are now restored, I believe. And here's the, here's the second one coming out. Right. Yeah, he was the smart one. Stayed out. Um, this is another uh, relatively well-known arcade raid, probably, probably the most audacious arcade raid that was ever pulled off in the UK. I can sort of very quickly tell you the tale. Um, urban exploration you guys might be familiar with, so that's where people of a certain disposition will um, uh, break into abandoned buildings and take photographs of paint peeling off the walls, or they'll climb up to the top of the Eiffel Tower in the middle of the night and 
um, and what have you. This was posted on a, an expedition um, forum, and the guy said, I found this abandoned ship, I got in and I took a load of pictures. One of the pictures he took was, was this picture. Um, the yellow thing is a kiddie ride, it's like a helicopter that goes up and down. Um, and someone pointed out, oh look, there's a couple of arcade machines. Uh, the same guy who pulled off the Irish raid noticed this and decided to do some digging. Again, I think he used the geotag on the photo to find out where this ship was, and it turned out it was the Duke of Lancaster. The Duke of Lancaster used to be a uh, passenger boat um, which operated in the 50s right through to the 70s. In the 70s, it was dry docked and turned into a like family fun centre, um, part of which, which used to be the car deck, they turned to an arcade. Um, it then ran into all sorts of trouble about, around access and the local authority, and it got closed down, the doors were closed, and literally everything inside was sealed shut. Um, this would have been sometime in the early 80s. Um, so Oliver again did his due diligence. He rang everybody in the local village, trying to find out who owned the boat, how could he get access, what was the story. Eight months later, he finally got a lead, managed to get hold of the family who still owned the boat, and what he established was, yeah, we own the boat. Yes, there are arcade machines inside. And yes, everything is for sale. So uh, the guys turned up. They uh, did a recce. Um, and this is what they found. So this used to be the car deck where you would drive your car on, park the car, get out the car, and go and sit down, and the boat would go wherever. Um, it was just full, it was like a, a tomb, literally. Everything had just been closed, nothing had been touched. Um, it was all sat there uh, uh, since the early 80s. I won't bore you with the video, but suffice to say, there was a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, so arrangements were made. The guy said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll fix a date. Um, they agreed a price. You guys need to come here and get it all out in a day. Oh, and by the way, uh, you need to think about how you're going to get the cabinets out. And he was right, because the only way out of the car deck was pretty much at the top of the boat, as you can see here. So how are you going to get a 300-pound Space Invader machine from 50 foot up in the air? So they hired a crane. So as well as turning up with half a dozen trucks, they hired a full-sized crane for the day, and uh, four at a time, they loaded the arcade cabinets onto a platform, and the crane got them down, dropped them off at the bottom, the cabinets were dished out, and everybody went home happy. Um, there you go. That was, that was quite the raid. Uh, back to Jen with more missing pictures from the North Carolina raid. Jen, what can you tell us? So this is this this pinpoints on um, don't talk about a raid until you actually have it done. So I lived in North Carolina and there's this North Carolina forum and they all talk about hey we got this guy he's selling all these games and um, they go there and they couldn't they couldn't get the guy to budge they weren't he wasn't willing to sell them at prices that these guys were willing to pay me just to get them. I don't care, I mean, honest, I care what I pay, but I look like if I pay this much for this game and this much for this game, if I sell this one for 5,000 and I sell this one for 200, it balances out at the end. So I, I do a bulk buy, if I say I say I spend $13,000 on 40 games, and it breaks it down to like 400 a game, and if I sell a game for 8,000 and I could take a loss on one. So that's, that's how I do it and I don't, I don't mind. These guys are looking at it like, well, we're not paying 800 for this game and we're not, pay, you know, so. I go in there, so they, they put it on there. I end up getting the guy's number. I do the, I, you know, I find him. I'm like, I go in, I show up, I don't know, lots of money, throw it in his face and said, let me pick out the games. So this is, this is part of it. He wouldn't sell the Spectre. That was his very first arcade game he said he ever bought. He used to run a route and roller skates and stuff. So I picked and, so we got to pick and choose. He was very hesitant on some games. We couldn't get a punch out from him. We couldn't get some pinballs from him. 
but we did get some games. So we have to, I mean, literally, when we do raids, we climb in, we climb over the games, we have to move stuff. It's it's not easy work. And people think, oh, you just go buy games and here they are. Why are, you know, it's, they don't see the behind the math of the truck rentals, the gas, the time, the cleaning, you know, and the going over it. So everybody's like, they don't see the behind the scenes. So this is some behind the scenes there. So this was another building on the property. You had four, four or five buildings. That's a zookeeper in the back there. It had a control panel on it before this picture was taken. So I see it. And this was like a two-story building, and I see this thing. So I'm walking across, and I fall through the floor. So, and my partner is in another building. I don't, and we have no reception. We're in the middle of freaking nowhere. So now I'm like silence of the lamb shit in like a cellar on the floor with like a cracked rib, right? Because I hit this thing going down, and I'm just laying there like, all right, well, this is, this is the end. So... Um, I'm laying there and I'm like, all right, what the hell am I gonna do? So I, I mean, I'm, my, my rib was cracked, so I'm like laying there, so I'm, I, so there's like some beams, so, and I, like, it's like three foot, so I, I'm right here, so I have to like pull myself up on these rafters and crawl across it. So these games were literally melting in the floor. You can see some sunlight coming in. So they're, they're I mean, they're just d deteriorating, but I was able to pull the zookeeper control panel, the board set and stuff, and it was, it was, you know, savable, so we, we were able to, to get, you know, it's just, the whole roof was blown off, and I thought I was gonna die that day, but we ended up pulling, I think, 25 games from him. We got some play choices, Mortal Kombat's. I think, um, uh, there, this, was, this was one of the loads from a Tempest play choice. We got a, count, a play choice countertop there. Um, uh, I think we got a Nibbler. Um, so he had some good games. So we, we kind of cherry picked it. I went back a couple times and, and got some more just to, to buy some more. But um, that is the story of how I became a hated person in North Carolina. And they still don't like me because I, I undershot everybody and went there and, and got all those games. But they still hate me there. I'm not welcome back. So every time they know I'm coming there, they, I hear some rumor. You know, they, they growl. So, but I mean, I don't. I get hated on a lot in this in this hobby because I do this and you know they don't see the hard work I put into it because I actually do like these games. I like getting them back out. Like I mean I have 45 50 games in my collection, but Andy, I don't know if he's in here from Arcade Monsters, like I took him on a raid with me in North Carolina and we kind of got in a little quarrel like I wanted the Cubert, he wanted the Cubert and we're like who gets the Cubert and you know, I'm like not gonna lose a friendship over an arcade game, and they own an arcade, and they could put it in there, and the public gets to enjoy it and stuff. Is it's just gonna be in my garage, and I'll play it maybe once a month or something. So I'm more about getting the games out back in the public, back to collectors that like them. I mean, I've got my collection to where it's games I like and I remember. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to keep them. So I, everything I buy anymore goes back out to be enjoyed by by other people in in here at the show stuff. So that's why I enjoy doing it. Just it's more for the fun of the hunt and just getting the games back out in the wild for me. So that's a real key point, actually. That as, as as Jen says, um, for me, it's the thrill of the chase. It's having a bit of an adventure, a bit of an experience, tracking these things down and getting them. It's, it's not so much about storing them or owning them, or, right? It's it's just the the sort of fun of picking out these things and finding where they are. So there you go. That's what goes behind uh, probably an awful lot of the machines you see on the floor behind. Uh, they don't appear from eBay, and indeed they don't just appear out of thin air. There's a, usually a story behind every cabinet you end up playing at a show like Free Play Florida. Um, I think we, we can do five minutes of questions if anybody has anything. Our roving reporter, Paul, has a microphone. Uh, two questions. One for Jen. Uh, how do you stay away from termites? And for Tony, I guess there's no pickup trucks or very few pickup trucks in the UK. So how do you get somewhere fast and be able to move a game really quickly? So I'm not from here. And thank God, because it's hot as hell here. So I'm trying to get back out of here. But I haven't dealt with termites till I've actually came down here. I, we don't have termites up. I mean, we have them, but they don't, they're not like they are here. Um, I did a raid down in Miami. I'm kind of hated in Miami on this bullshit too, but um, I did a raid down there where every game was termite damaged. Like there was probably 30 games we pulled out of there. Every last one of them watered and termite damaged. 
Um, I rented a storage unit. I stripped every game in there. I took everything metal, everything parts. I had a 10, I have a 15 by 50 storage unit of nothing but arcade parts that I've been selling for 15 years to people to restore their games. I rented the storage unit. I stripped every game in there. And if you break your lease or you move out and you leave shit in there, it's a $500 fine. 35 termite damage cabinets. I slapped $500 on the cab on the counter and said, I'm out of the unit. And he got pissed, but I didn't break the rules, you know, but I wasn't going to deal with that mess. Like, I mean, that's because Miami from here, that's like, I'm not running a truck to move damaged wood. So, but I did have one cabinet with active termites. So if you guys want tips on that, get a piece of wet cardboard, put it in the bottom of your cabinet. The termites get attracted to that. It's a termite trap. Wrap it in um, blue tarps, like the hell out of it, and then get the termite spray, and you can make your own little fumigation thing. And they were dead in like the day, and I've never had a termite problem anything other than that. So, it's fun. Uh, we don't have pickup trucks in the UK, but we, we do have cars and vehicles and vans and stuff, so <laughs> we're not completely in the dark ages. Um, we just, we don't have pickup trucks. Horses it, and buggies. For, for the most part, yeah, exactly. We, we, we usually find a way. So typically we would rent a van, so I guess like, like you guys rent U-Haul or Pensk. Uh, we, Pensk. We have the equivalent Pensk. thing over, who? Pensky. Pensky, okay. So we have the equivalent of Penske in the UK, and so we, we would rent a van and, and, and fill it up. Yeah, we, 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 we kind of get there in the end. It's also amazing how many, how it's possible to fit a cabinet into a relatively small car. You'll, you'll be surprised at how, uh, yeah. So yeah, we get by. Got any more questions? Any more? No? Nope. Yeah. Hey. My question's for Jen. Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Pardon? All right. Um, my question is for Jen. Um, have you ever done an arcade raid for um, like abandoned malls for arcade? Like, for example, like Pocket Change or um, Aladdin's Castle. Have you found any that were just left? I have not done mall raids or anything like uh, that was actually in a. Oh, I did a roller skate one back in Missouri. We did that. And then. Um, I flew up to Michigan and did a raid from an old operator there. Um, but most of them's just been independent arcades or roller skates. I haven't done any commercial, like mall. Like I have a couple of, Aladdin, I have an Aladdin's Castle cabinet that came from, Georg from Georgia. I did a 45 game raid from there and we actually pulled like a, so actually this, going back on the, um, don't tell anybody about the raids. So because I'm predominantly known for doing this and being able to have the resources to fly out and, and able to do this, I was contacted from a guy named Mark in Georgia and he said, hey, I got this lead on these games. And he sent me the pictures and he's like, can you tell me how much these are worth? And I'm looking at the pictures and I'm sending them the legit values. There's Qbert, Satan's Hollow, um, Mar uh, Dark Planet in 3D, that's a Stern, it's a super rare game, Cosmic Chasm. So I tell him what he's worth and he's like, all right, well, I can get them, but I don't have the money. So it was 43 games, and I think I dropped, me and, me and um, my boss went in on it, and we, um, we paid, like, I want to say, like, 13000 So we got a cut. So we, I go there. I, I, I drive there. Um, so because the guy brought us in, if you give me a lead on it, I take care of you. We gave him a Qbert, a Frogger, and whatever ever game he picked out. So we gave him three games for free, no, no strings attached. I rented a the biggest truck they had, um, and I had to tow my car back. So I fill up the box truck, and there was like five Nintendo cabinets and a, the Cuddy cabin. So we put the cabarets there, and I lift up the Nintendo cabinets, and I slide them across the top of games. And I put like 40 games in a 26-foot truck somehow, some way, and then I drove it back here. And the Cosmic Chasm, we just didn't get it finished, the monitor. It would have been on the floor, but we get some, I mean, if you give me a lead, I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to screw anybody over. I mean, it's just to get them back out there. So every game, we had a lasso. Brian Jones got that. A lot of those, they were a lot of high-end games. Doc Mack over in uh, Illinois, he got the, the, the stern one. So I try to get them out to where people are going to enjoy them. So they're in, they're in arcades being, being enjoyed now. But I haven't done commercial ones. I wish I could, but. I think we've got time for one more. Last question. Oh, and you can take Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. That was Arcade Raids. If you liked what you hear, if you're interested in Arcade Raids, do check out my website, arcadeblogger.com, and you will find a plethora of Arcade Raid pictures and stories and tales from all over the world 
uh, some of which I've been involved with, some of which Jen's been involved with, with others. Uh, just guys have just shared pictures with me and I've just got it written up. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of, whole bunch of stuff there.